I believe all things are possible. Oh. all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is still a privilege to come into the presence of the Lord this morning and I always say where would we be had not God sent the prophet? Amen. Where would we be had he not sent this message? What would we be preaching had he not sent this message? I don't know how many are thankful that God sent a prophet in the end times and how many are not ashamed of this prophet? I certainly am not afraid, ashamed of this prophet. As we turn to the book of Ephesians and just uh, to the elders, uh, thank you for the invitation. And even yesterday we had a, a lovely time. I don't want to say with the elderly, I want to say with the veterans. I think that is the proper uh, description. Uh, amen. God bless you, brother, so much for a warm introduction. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. If you don't mind, I will read, then you read after me. This is good for young people to read the Bible as well. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. To the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, 
Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. As we bow our heads, gracious Heavenly Father, we have read a portion of a scripture here. And Lord, we depend on your inspiration. You have known about this service before the foundation of the world. You knew exactly who would be sitting where and what their needs would be. And I believe if you knew, you made provision for their needs. I stand behind the holy desk this morning, shut down my intelligence. Let it be you that will operate. That when we come to the end of the service, your name must be glorified. And everyone must have a closer walk with the Lord. We commit everything to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you as you take the comfort of your seats. I just want to take a couple of minutes and speak on our divine origin. Our divine origin is the subject that I would want us to look into, and with the help of the quotations and scriptures, per adventure someone may understand that our origin, we are not South Africans or Congolese or Zimbabweans, but we come from God. And that's exactly where we are returning back to. I like it when Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. You know, Paul knew exactly who made him to be an apostle. That it was not by popular demand, but it was by the will of God. And I believe this morning, many of us can say we are message believers by the will of God. It is not by persuasion of people. It was by the will of God that we should be what we are in the end time. And it says, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ. You know, when you write, when Paul wrote this, the prophet says, he was writing to the people that are saints or Christians, not to the outsiders. Even the message that we have received is not the message for the outsiders. It is the message for the insiders. Now, who are the insiders? These are the people that were in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. This is, what, this, this is the people that this message is intended for or it is sent to. Amen. You know, the problem is that if you intercept a letter that is not meant for you, and it lands into your wrong hands, you're going to take that letter for granted. You might even misinterpret that letter. But if the letter reaches the right recipient, the right recipient knows and can be even able to read between the lines. So this message is not just for everyone, but it is for the predestinated seed. And once this message lands into the hands of the predestinated seed, they will appreciate this message. But if it lands into the wrong hands, they will criticize it, they will undermine it, because it is not meant for them. I hope we are together this morning. And I like it because it says, He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, in heavenly places in Christ. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. 
Now, the prophet in the message, the believer's position in Christ, paragraph 21, he says, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, now this letter is addressed to them, not to the outside world. It's not a sermon. Paul wasn't preaching yet to the unsaved. He was preaching to the saved, the called out, the separated, the set aside, and the faithful in the call. Now, that's who he is addressed to it to, to in Jesus. The believer's position in Christ, and the prophet says, the believer can only worship Christ as he is positionally placed in Christ. I hope we are together here. Now, when you are a believer, you know, you, you must find your position in Christ. And I'm going to show you what the prophet means about your position in Christ. A lot of confusion gets created when people are not in their position. As much as I can admire Brother Somers, but I can never be him. I can only be me, and I can only operate the way God created me to be. That's why the best advice that I can give you, be who God created you to be. And remain in your position. And I'm going to show you how your position is revealed to you. If you are not called to, to do something and you attempt to do it, you are going to create a mess. And I believe all Timers know what I'm speaking about. The reason we've got a mess today is because certain things are being done by people that were not called to, to do them. I hope we are together here. Now, the prophet says, the believer's position in Christ, he carries on. He says, I don't believe you get it. Let me go another route. Look. A believer cannot worship and has no right to worship. No man has no right to worship the Lord outside of being in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope we're together. So outside being within the body of Christ, you've got no right to worship. And maybe I'm going to take it further. The right to worship that God accepts in our time is under the banner of the message of the hour. Yes, others are worshipping, and some of them sincerely so. But God has got only one provided way in an age. And in our age, it is the message of the hour. And in our age, he sent Elijah the prophet. And no matter where you go, no matter how much you know, no matter how much experience you have, you can never be better than the prophet messenger. What he gave us is the best. And it needs not to be improved. This message has got no mistakes. If you find a mistake in the message, go back to God and say, God, help me to see the mistake. This help me to have a revelation. Because if you see a mistake, that means you don't have a revelation. This message comes from the Almighty God to the heart of the believer. And I say, this message is mistakes proof. Amen. Now, the prophet comes because I want to dwell on this position of a believer in Christ. They ask him a question in COD. They say, how does one know their rightful position in the body of Christ? And I believe everybody that is very sincere in their call, everybody that is sincere in their worship of God, they would want to know their rightful position in the body of Christ. Now, the prophet answers the person and says, that would be the kind of questions amongst many of us here tonight and in our case this morning. How do you rightfully know? Now, I'm presuming that this brother wants to know what position, what in Christ, what part of Christ do I play? Now, for instance, I would, like, I would, I would say it like this, brother, to give you the best answer I know. Your position in Christ is revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. And it carries on, it says, then if you want to know whether it's the Holy Spirit or not, find out whether he blesses what you are doing or not. If he blesses it, then that's him. And if he doesn't bless him, that means that's not him. So every time, that is why a believer, before he does everything, he wants to check that, am I led by the Holy Spirit? A believer is not led by friends. And a believer is not even led by a family. 
A believer is led by the Holy Spirit. That's why on a daily basis we seek the approval of the Holy Spirit. Are you happy with what I'm doing? Are you blessing what I'm doing? And if the Holy Spirit doesn't bless it, then you need to repent and say, Holy Spirit, lead me. I hope we are together here. Now, the prophet speaks about the heavenly places. In Christ is the mystery of God revealed, paragraph 182. It says, heavenly places. Oh, how I wish I had time. Here I've got it marked right here in my Bible about heavenly places. What is heavenly places? Heavenly places, just for a moment, is the believer's position in Christ. Where the believer stands in Christ in heavenly places. And I want to say, once you find that position, you can never be shaken by anything. And uh, when you have not found that position, you're going to be tossed about. You know, there are people in this message that I deem to be immo immovable. There are people in this message that I deem to be infallible. Yes, I'm using the word infallible, knowing that they will make mistakes, but they will repent, but they will never go back to the world. They are into this for a long haul. But those that have not found their rightful positions, every doctrine that comes, it sways them this way. Every wind of doctrine that comes, it tows them about. But there are people that are rooted in Christ. Not just in an assembly, but in Christ. You need not to find just a local assembly. You must find Christ. Because once you are in Christ, you are fortified. You are protected. You're going to go through the trials of life, but you will remain unaffected. Things may go wrong, but you will remain in your position as a worshiper. I know such a believer, Job was such a believer. Trial after trial, but he remained a worshiper. Because why? He was not a circumstantial worshiper. He was a worshiper by revelation. We are looking for believers that are believers by revelation. Even when people turn their back on you, you still worship God. Even when things go against you, you still worship God. Because worshiping God is your DNA. I hope we are together here. Now I'm still on our divine origin. The prophet says in this message, who is this Melchizedek? Paragraph 116. It says, show plainly. The predestinated is the only one that's considered in redemption. He says, did you get it? He says, let me say that again. The predestinated is the only one that's considered in redemption. People might be making like think they are, but the real redemption is those that are predestinated. Because the very way to redeem means to bring back. Is that right? To redeem anything is bring it back to its original place. Hallelujah. So it's only the predestinated will be brought back because the others didn't come from there. Hallelujah. But you as a believer, you come from there. That's why you can be redeemed back to your original place. And if you've got no place of your origin, if you've got no original place, it is difficult to redeem you back to where you have never been to. Are you still with me? We are going to heaven because we come from heaven. Are you still with me? We are believers because we were believers before we came here. Are you still with me? We are worshippers because we were worshippers before we came here. Our worship didn't start in time. That's why it will never be affected by time. We were worshippers before time. And maybe let me take it further. We were even worshippers before the devil was there. Because we are the attributes of God. So there is nothing that will change a believer in time because the believer comes from eternity and the believer is returning back to eternity. Amen. I hope we are together here. The, the circumstances, your income, your family background, things that you go through, they can never change you. Are you still with me? And some, I need to take it further. We are not even worshippers by marriage. Even if your marriage partner leaves you, you are still a worshipper. Because you were a worshipper before marriage, you are a worshipper even after marriage. It is not circumstantial. Maybe I need to take it further. I'm not a worshipper because I'm a preacher. Even if I stop preaching, I'm a worshipper. 
worship is not a position in church. Worship is a matter of origin. That's where you come from. That's your DNA. Amen. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Now the prophet in the message, Israel and the church. You are going to check a lot of times. The reason we were able to find each other here is because we found each other there. And if I loved you from there, I will love you here. And if you were my brother and my sister from there, you will be my brother and my sister here. Time is not going to change anything. And, you know, the beauty about it, there's been a magnet in our time. This magnet is the message of the hour. It hovered around the world. And the people that were in the mind of God as attributes, they were magnetized to this magnet. And I'm looking at those people. They come from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different nations. But here they are together because they realized before I became an American, I was a believer. Before I became a South African, I'm a believer. That's why national spirit shall never divide us. We are the nation of God. I hope we are together. In the message, Israel and the church, paragraph 49. The prophet says, now before you can become a Christian, God called you. This we've got to, you've got to remember. You didn't just find this message because you were smart. God found you. And it says God called you. Not you calling God. God called you. Now he called Abraham. He is the father of us all, the faith. Notice, he said Abraham, meaning he called him by name. God knows you by name. God knows where you were. And he called me. The day you met the message of the hour, it was not a coincidence. It was foreordained before the foundation of the world that you will meet the message of the hour. And when maybe you were in a taxi, maybe somebody took out the spoken word, and you just got uh, interested, and you asked questions, and they testified to you, and they brought you to church, and you were baptized. God knew exactly the minute when you were going to come in contact with his revealed way. But here is something beautiful. There was something in you to respond to the revealed way. Because there are people that hear the message, they love the message, they appreciate the message, but there is nothing in them to respond to the revealed word of God. But you are blessed. Because when the word is being preached, something beyond the flesh moves and responds and say amen to that. What is that? That is the gene of God. Hope we are together. In the message, Israel and the church, he carries on, paragraph 5-0. It says now it's election. I want to get on that election strong because it's the truth. You didn't become a Christian just coincidence because you become a Christian before you was in this world. Before you were born, God ordained you to be a Christian. My, my. Before you were born, God ordained you to be a Christian. And how many things the devil did try to stop you from becoming a Christian, and he has felt miserably so. Why? Because you were ordained to believe this. Some of you could have died prematurely, but God protected you until you came in contact with the truth, because you were ordained to believe this message. I know another old lady, I think she had three heart attacks and four strokes. In her senior years, and later the message was presented to her, and as soon as she believed the message, few years, a few days down the line, she passed on. The heart attack couldn't take her. She was ordained. There was a moment ordained. Sickness couldn't take her. Old age couldn't take her because there was a divine appointment. There was somewhere where she was coming from, and God wanted her to believe this message and go back where she comes from. So the prophet says, before you were born, God ordained you to be a Christian from the Garden of Eden, from before the foundation of the world. Oh, you say, is that right, brother? That's the truth. Before, there was ever, before you ever knew anything, 
There was a time that you knew. Your mind was darkened to that now. There's only, there's only being one man on earth that knew he was before. That was Jesus. That means when you were born, you had spiritual amnesia. You didn't know who you were. And maybe you were part of your family and you thought that's all you, what you were. Maybe you belonged to a church and you thought that's all you were. But later on, because God wanted to remove amnesia, in order to remove amnesia, you've got to take a person to what we call familiar places. And when we came in contact with the message, the message took you to familiar places. And what is the familiar places? There is a statement that Brother Brennan makes. Every time I hear that statement, something in me moves. When he says, before God became God. Something in me says, I know him before he became God. Amen. Who was he? It's a self-existing one. Elohim. What is he that to me? A familiar place. Amen. When he says, the opening of the way, the third pool is the opening of the way. Is that a familiar place? I, there is the revelation of the son of man. That's a familiar place. How many familiar places are there? Listen to the tapes. You will find familiar places. Amen. So the prophet comes here in question and answers. Paragraph 78, 78. He says, I said in the beginning, what you are somewhere else is what you reflect here. This is profound. What you are, you are, what your celestial or terrestrial body is up yonder, what your celestial body is somewhere else, is what you are reflecting back here. That is why the message of the hour doesn't trace you here. The message of the hour traces you there. And if the message finds you there, then you will be found here. If you believe there, you will believe here, because what you are here reflects what you are there. If you are an unbeliever here, it reflects where you come from. Are you still with me? I hope we are together. Remember, we were believers even before we came here. We were worshippers even before we came here. The Bible says the lamb was slain. In, it was slain before the foundation of the world in God's mind. Your prophet in the message, the serpent seed, he prays a prayer. In that prayer he says, how, did we know, how do we not know that it was exactly at the same time when the lamb was slain, when the sons of God shouted and rejoiced? So the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And I want to say, you were there. You accepted the spiritual Calvary before there was Calvary in Jerusalem. You accepted Jesus Christ before he came into flesh. That's why when he was here, you were able to accept him. Even our prophet, he must be your prophet from eternity. He is not a prophet from America. He is a prophet from eternity. It says in the spirit land, what you are is what you are here. If you are still vulgar minded and so forth in the spirit land, you are vulgar minded here. If you still got malice, envy, strife, you are in the spirit land with that. It reflects it back here. But if your whole innermost being has become cleansed and patched, it shows that you've got your body out, you're under waiting, that's been cleansed and patched, and it's reacting back in the flesh. I hope we are together here. Let me take it further as a diagram, maybe, so that you understand what I mean. Maybe the next slide, my brother. If you're a student of the message, you'll know Brother Brim says he was Elohim, meaning the self-existing one. And he says out of that Elohim came out a halo. He says the Bible readers, they call it the Logos. And you find it in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the weight. The weight was with God, and the weight was God. And Brother Bram said the Logos was not the, the second person, but it was the invisible God moving from the invisible to the visible. Amen. It's not a second God. It's the same Jehovah. It's the same Elohim. But now he poured himself into the Logos. Are you still with me? Then that Logos became flesh. Now, let's put it this way. So when he was Elohim, 
You, if you are predestinated, and if you have got a divine origin, you were there as an attribute. Are you still with me? Now, when he put himself into the logos, you were there because you had the weight body, meaning a theophany. When he became flesh, if I give maybe an example with a Samaritan woman, she met, they met at the well of Jacob. But before they could meet at the well of Jacob, they were together before the foundation of the well. Here on earth, she was a prostitute. But where she comes from, her divine origin, she was not a prostitute. She was a predestinated seed. So even you, you were a sinner here. But where you come from, you are not a sinner. You are a, you are a predestinated seed. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. But you developed amnesia, and maybe you committed sin. And I'm going to show you where the prophet said, today you are justified. Amen. What does it mean? You have never done it in the first place. Amen. I hope we are together. Now, today, John chapter 1. You know, Genesis, there is Genesis chapter 1, where Moses says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But I want to say, you were there before Genesis chapter 1. And John comes and says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. I want to say, you were there in John chapter 1. And William Brenham said, let us go back at the back part of the mind of God. I want to say, you were there at the back part of the mind of God. So your divine origin is from the mind of God. You are a thought of God expressed in this time. I hope we are together. So the prophet Corey's on, he says, in the message, who is this Melchizedek? Paragraph 5-0. He says, remember, you, your eyes, your stature, whatever you was, you were in his thinking at the beginning. And the only thing that you are is expression, wait. After he thought it, he spoke it, and here you are. Now, the prophet wants to tell you, God thought of you, and God spoke you, and here you are. And if you were a thought, there is nothing that will stop you from becoming the weight. Because the weight is a thought expressed. So if you were a thought in the mind of God, you will become the weight made flesh today. I hope we are together. He says, after you thought it, he spoke it, and here you are. If it isn't, if you wasn't in his thinking, there is no way at all for you ever be there. For he is the one that gives eternal life. Now, we can preach until we are blue in the face. But unless you were there, you will never be found. But if you were there, as soon as something goes on in church, something moves in you, you say, I remember, I'm not just a bunch of flesh and bones. Before this flesh, there was somewhere where I was. Where were you in the mind of God? Amen. I hope we are together. Amen. Now the prophet makes a striking statement. In the message, it is the rising of the sun. Paragraph 242. The prophet said, but remember, he went with you in him, referring to Gethsemane. He says, see, God had never separated the bride from the groom yet. So when God looked down upon the body of Christ, he saw both male and female. And what was the female part? You were that part. It says it was all redeemed in that one body. They are one, same weight, same weight, spoke of the groom, speaks of the bride. He carries on, he says, but remember, he carries on in the message, the seed shall not be here with the shark, following up on that one, paragraph 79. He says he was the way. The logos, the weight that went out of God, when it began to brood upon the earth, it brought forth marine life. When the spirit of God, the logos, the weight, which God said, let there be, and there went to the logos, which was the weight. Now that same logos has a part. He's got a bride. Now if the logos is the weight, it means the bride must be the weight. That means whatever material that makes up the logos, it's exactly the same material that will make up the bride. 
That's why the bride will never deny the way because the bride herself, she is the way. Are you still with me here? So now we can go back to John chapter 1 and say, in the beginning was the way. So today you can say, I was there. The way it was with God, I was there. The way it was God, I was there. The way it was made flesh, I was there. Why? Because you are part of the process. You are not a spectator. That's why, folks, if you are not there, you are going to be confused. You know, in the Bible, some Jehovah Witnesses would say, would hear the statement, the Lord said unto my Lord, and they say, you see, it's two gods. But as that come from there, we know it's not two gods. Are you still with me? If Brother Somers is here, and maybe he's a teacher in the class, and his son is in the same class, and the headmaster comes to him and says, I want you to write to all the parents in your class. He's going to write to all parents. And him being Mr. Somers, is going to say, Dear Mr. Somers, on such and such a day, I let you know there's going to be a meeting. And at the bottom, he's going to sign from Mr. Somers. Now, if you don't know Brother Somers, you're going to think it is two people. But if you know Brother Somers, you will know it's Brother Somers, the teacher who wrote for your Brother Somers, the parent, but it's exactly the same person. The Lord said unto my Lord, is the offices of the Father and the Son communicating of the same God. But you cannot know that unless you come from there. Are you still with me? Amen. I was watching when they were playing, the Jones were playing a play yesterday for the veterans. Now, if maybe one of the, his sons, maybe is a, is a very good actor, and maybe they want him to come on stage and maybe play a part of a teacher, he would come on stage Maybe he's so good that they want him to play two roles in the same play. That means he would come on stage as a teacher, and then as he's playing on stage, what is going to hit happen for him to transition from one character to the next? That means he's got to go backstage and change the costume and come back to act the next role. And the people in the audience that do not know the boy they're going to walk away thinking that the two boys are good actors. But the people that know the Jones are, they know it's the same boy that was a teacher, but he went backstage and changed the costume and came back in a different costume, but it's the same boy. Unless I go, the comforter will not come. Why couldn't you have the comfort and Jesus at the same time? It's because he had to go backstage to change the costume. But the believers, they know the same Jesus became the Holy Ghost. Yeah. But if you don't know, you end up with two gods or three gods. Lack of a revelation. And I want you to take it further. It may say you are not from there. Because if you come from there, you will know when characters transition. And somebody say amen to that. Amen. Now, the Samar, Jesus says something very striking to the Samaritan woman. In John chapter 4, verse 23. And I want us to read it together to make sure some are awake. John chapter 4, verse 23. Read after me. But the hour cometh, and now, is, and now is, when the true worshipers, when the true worshipers shall, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. shall worship the Father in spirit. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now, listen to how Jesus puts it to the Samaritan woman. He does not say, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship God. He says, shall worship the Father. And I, I want to, maybe let me put it this way. He is God to everyone, but is not a father to everyone. Some you'll catch it on your way home. 
He is God to everyone, but is not the Father to everyone. Those that call him the Father, they must have his genes. Now, he's telling you the time is coming where worship will not be a matter of locality, but it will be a matter of genetics. Are you still with me here? So, now, when we speak about the genes, my son is my son. Even when I'm unhappy or upset with him, he's still my son. There are times where I will become upset, and when he speaks, I just see myself. And all of a sudden, I realize this is me. What is happening? The genes. There may be times when he's upset with me, but as soon as he walks, I, he now feels that like I walk like daddy. Because what's happening? Who he is does not depend on a feeling. Who he is, it's a matter of genes. Now you, if you are a son or a daughter of God, it's a matter of genes. Wherever you go, you speak and walk and live like your father. Why? It's not a church affair. It's a genetical matter. Now, even if your son can come and say, I don't want to be part of this family anymore. I'm done with this family. I'm so upset with you. There are people that will meet your son in town. And when they greet him, they're going to say, I'm going to use you, Jones. You'll bear with me. They're going to say, hey, Joe, little Jones. Even though he may say, I have disowned the family, but those that know him, they see the walk, that the walk is of the Jones. The way he talks is the Jones. The gestures are of the Jones. It is not his choice. It is the nature of the Jones expressing itself through the boy. Thank be to God. I am a son of God. You are a daughter of God. The nature of God expresses itself through us until people say, you are different. What makes you different? The nature of God in you. I hope we are together. Let's come to this. Question and answers, paragraph 21. The process, but now, this picture is the main thing. Then in the resurrection, those gases and acids and things comes right back into the place and develops this picture again. Now, this picture was not taken when you were 16 or 18 or 20 years old at your best. When was it taken? Before there was the foundation of the world, it was put in God's great fire. I want you to follow the thought. Before the foundation of the world, God took a picture of you, and filed it in his great fire. That picture was not taken when you were 20, 80. It was taken before the foundation of the world, when you were in your perfect state. Maybe if you lost your arm, maybe here, God doesn't see you as somebody that is armless. God is looking in the perfect picture. He sees you complete. Are you saying, now you're going to see why the devil becomes upset with God. Because, remember, the devil collects all mi your mistakes. He remembers where you were born, what you did, and from time to time he wants to remind you. Then he goes back to God and says, look at this fella, look what he has done, look what he did. And God looks at the great file, look at the picture in your perfect state, and say, I even love him more. And the devil gets confused and says, despite all the mistakes, God is not looking at your terrestrial life. God is looking at the life that you had before the foundation of the world. Amen. Are you still with me here? Amen. Now, let's carry on. When was it taken before, the, before there was a foundation of the world? It was put in God's great fire. Then the only thing it did was featured itself here for you to make your choice. Then you become a servant of God. Him, for knowing it, makes him a redeemer as we've been through it. Now the prophet in question and answers, he says, carries on. So I don't care what they would do with you. They cannot destroy that profile. That picture is in God's great gallery up there. It cannot destroy it. It's in heaven. 
Now, I want to give you illustration here. If the rapture terrorists, we, we, we're going to die. Now, for a child of God, an undertaker has no role to play unless the uptaker acts first. Now, I'm going to just be on you, Brother Jones, because you were acting yesterday. Now, if you are, a, you are, if you are Mr. Jones, and you live, maybe you get sick, maybe you die. What is happening, the Jones, they've got a legal right to come and claim the remains. Because it belongs to them. But there is a part within Mr. Jones that does not come from the Jones. Now, before they can claim their part, the uptaker must come and extract his part. Are you still with me? So you must have a relationship with the uptaker more than you are having a relationship with the undertaker. Are you still with me? So when you leave, you are a dual being. I looked at the old timers yesterday. Some of them, they are old. And then the knees are aching. But I'm looking and say, inside, there are no aches. There is another body that has been formed by the message of the hour, and that body is becoming new and new every day. Amen. And that body is made in the image of Melchizedek. Amen. That body is without the beginning of days, without the ending of days. Amen. Hope we are together here. Let's come to this one. We're going to enjoy this. When you were born, Brother Bram speaks about the two books, the book of life, and the Lamb's book of life. He says the book of life is the book of deeds. In the message of the invisible union of the bride, paragraph 224, he says now your name is now in the new book, not the book of life, but the Lamb's book of life. What the Lamb redeemed. Not the old book of your natural union, but your new bride. Your new life is in the Lamb's book of life, your marriage certificate. Hallelujah. Where your true eternal gem from the beginning takes hold. Now, you're not only forgiven, but you are justified. It says glory, justified. Romans 5, 1 said, yeah. Therefore, being justified by faith. Look up the word. The word don't mean forgiven. The word means justified. It don't mean you are forgiven. But the word justified is though you never done it. It's not even regarded at all. How is it done? In God's book of the sea of forgetfulness, your old book and marriage is divorced and dead, and it's not even in the memories of God. Let me put it this way. If you lose your past, maybe it has your identity document. And the thugs get hold of your identity document. And they use your ID to commit a fraud. Maybe they go to Edgar's and open an account, Volcom, an open account, in your name. What you need to, to do is to go to the police station and file what we call an affidavit. The affidavit says, although certain things are going to be done under your name, but it's not you. Your name is there. It's your real name. Hallelujah. It is your identity, but it was not you. Now, if Vora confounds you and say, oh, you owe us this much money, you have opened an account, all you need to do is to go to Vora and produce the affidavit. Are you still with me? Even when they say, but it's your ID, you say, here is the affidavit. It was done in my name, but it's not me. Now, you as well, you've got the affidavit. There is a lot that has been done in your name. Lies were spoken in your name. Sins were committed in your name. But this morning, I want to say, you've got an affidavit. What is the affidavit? It was not you. It was the devil misusing your identity, 
Your real self can never be a sinner. So next time when the devil reminds you what you have done, tell him it's a matter of mistaken identity. I can never do that. Are you getting what I'm saying, folks? Even when the devil comes before God and says, look at this, look at that. God goes into his great fire. He looks at your theophany. He says, devil, are we talking about the real person? Because this person stands before me blameless. This person stands before me sinless. What happened? I look at him from his origin. Amen. Brother Brown say, even God cannot remember your sin. It has been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. I know some people develop complexes because when they came, before they came into the message, they did certain things and all their lives, the devil will keep on reminding you. I always give this illustration of the siblings. Maybe in the house, if you've got your brother, and maybe you see your brother doing mischief, maybe, maybe stealing money from your mom's purse. As a sibling, sometimes you don't act immediately. You just go and say, I saw you, but you owe me. <laughs> now, it's going to be a black maid. If you were taking turns to wash the dishes, then you are relieved because he needs to do that. Because why? He owes you. That means if there is a stack of dishes and mom says it's your turn, you say, Mom, he will do them. But because he knows that he's at fault, he just says, Mom, I will do them. Until mom is wondering, why are you always doing the dishes when I know you don't like to do the dishes? And you tell mom, Mom, and these days I love doing the dishes. <laughs> now, your brother one time maybe goes out to play with his friends. And you remain with mom. Then you go to mom and say, mom, you know, I was overtaken the other day, and I got tempted, and I stole your hundred rand note. Mom, I'm here to apologize. I'm sorry. And mom says, I forgive you, my son, but remember, repentance must have fruits. Now, mom forgives you, but your brother doesn't know. He comes in the evening and a zinc is full of dishes, and mom says, it's your turn to wash the dishes, and your brother looks at you, then you shake your head. <laughs> He's wondering, where's the protest coming from? Because I've got power over you. But you keep on saying, mm -mm. What happened? You are forgiven. <laughs> now, even you, there are things that you may have done. Today, I want to tell you, you are forgiven. If the devil say you can't raise your hands and worship God, turn the devil down and tell him, I'm not only forgiven, but I am justified. Yeah. Even God himself cannot remember it. Are you still with me, folks? Yeah. Brother Brum says in the message, show us the Father, it surfaces us. Paragraph 85. He says, what you have done, what you have to do with the tree, you take the tree and you plant it in the ground. Then you have to water it. And as you water it, it doesn't do nothing but drink, drink, drink. It has to drink more than its portion. And more it drinks, the bigger it swells up. It just pushes out limbs. Then it pushes out leaves. Then it pushes out blossoms. Then it pushes out apple. Is that right? That means when you have planted a tree, a, 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 an apple seed, into the ground, you don't go there and scream and say, give me the apple. All you've got to do, just water the seed. Are you still with me? The prophet says, that's the way a Christian is. We are planted together in Christ Jesus, who is the inexhaustible fountain of life. We are planted in Christ. We just drink, 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 and push out. And everything we have need of for the earthly journey, 
divine healing, the power of God, and all these other things is in every individual here that's received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For you are planted in Christ. He said, the Holy Ghost baptism, yes sir, everything you have need of for this life's journey, now he goes on, he said, even the rapture is right in you then. Do you get what he means? Divine healing is in you. Deliverance is in you. Everything that you need for life, victory is in you. Anything that you need is already deposited in you. I like it because he calls, he says, don't resent that. That's the truth. The rapture is in us now. Now, there are people that are think that the rapture is an event. The rapture is not an event. The rapture is a process. As we come, listen to the tapes, read the book, it's a rapturing process. We are building the rapturing faith. There is something developing in us, and that's why I want to say the rapture is already in us. And maybe even myself, I'd much better say, don't resent that. It's in you. Romans 8, verse 30. Let's read it together. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. So when God is looking at you this morning, he sees a complete work. You think you are still a work in progress, but when God looks at you, to him, it's already done deal. Remember, when God says you are healed, even though you may have symptoms to God, it's already a done deal. When God says you have overcome, to him, it's already a done deal. When God says you are perfect, to him, you are already perfect. God always looks things in their complete state. Amen. I hope we are together. Now let's come to this. You know, there are people that think they can sway other people away from the message. It's because they don't know how people came into the message. There are people, old timers that are here, they came into the message before there was internet. They didn't come into the message by Google. They came before there was Google. Some of them had dreams of the spoken words before. Some of them, they were just given a dream. Here is an address, write it to this address. You will receive message books. That's how they came. When the people have had that divine experience, you can never sway them away from the message. Are you still with me? And young people here, they must hear me. Don't depend on secondary information. Have a personal experience with God. Now, the prophet says, in the message taking sides with Jesus, paragraph 104, he says, them tapes will fall right into the hands of the predestinated seed, into the hands of the predestinated of God. He can direct the weight. He will direct everything just exactly to its cause. That's the reason he sent me back to do this, store up the food here. He forbid me to go to overseas. I like the statement where Brother Brown said, God will direct this message into the hands of the predestinated ones. And you as, assemb as an assembly, over the number of years, Brother, from the time of Brother Vail, you duplicated hundreds of thousands of tapes. You printed hundreds and thousands of books. And they've gone around the region and around the continent. And today people have come into the message because of your labor. Now, those tapes, when they were sent out, they didn't just go out. God's spirit was behind them to locate the predestinated sea. Maybe let me give an illustration. Maybe you shipped them into Malawi. Maybe they arrived in Malawi on an aeroplane. The pilot didn't know what was in the cargo. 
Maybe they were offloaded and put maybe onto a bike or maybe went through the customs at the, at the airport. The airport manager never got to know what was in the cargo. Maybe it got into a bike. The bike driver never got to know what was in the cargo until it reached a man in the village of Malawi. How did that spoken word reach that man? God directed that spoken word into the hands of the predestinated ones. And I say, as they came, as they came, they shall come also. So that's why. Our responsibility is not to make people believe the message, it's to make the message available. John chapter 6, verse 44. Let's read it together. It says, no man can come to me Unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. So today you are here. You were not brought by a man. You were not persuaded by a man. You were drawn by the Father. And if you were drawn by the Father, no man can persuade you otherwise. Because you know who called you. And I say, you were foreordained to be a message believer. And nothing here on time will stop you from believing the message. Trials will come, but you will remain steadfast. Challenges will come, you will remain steadfast. Things will happen, you will remain steadfast. Doctrines will come, you will remain steadfast. Why? You were foreordained to be a message believer. God bless you, church. God bless you, brother. So much. Amen. Amen. believe this morning. 